Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Gene Moreno. I'm the artistic director of Cannonball. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Emily Mello and the education department here at PAM uh, for hosting this, for co-presenting it with us. And um, I think we should say that this is a long, ongoing collaboration. We're going to be doing throughout the summer quite a few things. Um, and so I just have two preliminary notes before I introduce Brian Holmes. Uh, the first, I want to tell you about RAD, Research Art Dialogue, which is Cannonball's educational platform, and it's the reason Brian's here with us today. So what we did was last year we inaugurated what we can call an alternative school, and the goal of the school is threefold. It's to um, render more robust and dynamic the discourse around art production in the city, to introduce methodologies that maybe are not uh, very present here, and to generate new knowledge about Miami, which I think is one of the things Brian is helping us do. Um, the second preliminary note is that this is one of four lectures. Uh, the four lectures are called the, the River and the Steerman, and today's lecture is called Southwest Corridor, Northwest Passage. The other three lectures are going to take place at Cannonball, which is just down the street from us, and they will be next Tuesday at 7, next Thursday at 7, and a week from Monday at 7 as well. Uh, so that's, that's the preliminary stuff. Now, Brian. So Brian Holmes is often described as a cultural critic. I think this is both true and untrue. I think it's true in that he often generates important essays on how cultural production can function in the changing world we inhabit. But I think the description seems to veer from accuracy when we conjure up the familiar image of the cultural critic as, as someone, often an academic, scrutinizing cultural artifacts and trends from a distance, looking at the world with a certain degree of clinical cool coldness. Holmes, unlike this figure, seems to me to belong to the tradition of what we may call the partisan perspective. That is, the tradition of researchers who rather than begin from a pre-established set of premises and adhere to calcified protocols, first Im immer immerse themselves in the world as it actually is, and in the social movements that refuse to accept this world as it tilts grotesquely towards injustice. And only once they've done this, only then do they generate observations that are in consonance with the aspirations and experiences of this resistance. The partisan perspective has at least two things going for it. First, whatever material it generates should be useful to actual practices on the ground. And as such, it is burdened by a demand to strive, even when dealing with fi fine-grained technicalities for a common language over obfuscating jargon. And the second thing it has going is that all the phenomena it encounters, it encounters it as a historical entity or a historical object. Um, so the second as aspect is important because it ensures that our critical pre preoccupations um, aren't slanted towards phantoms of injustice or that we offer solutions that are ineffective, anchored to other times. It demands that we think the world as it is. In our case, it forces us to look at both finance, capitalism, and environmental instability. We have to think, on the one hand, in relation to things like transnational corporate platforms, high-frequency trading, just-in-time production, transmodal shipping, and forms of abstraction that have emerged with finance, capitalism, and the rapid progression of digital technologies. On the other hand, we have to deal with a planet that is beginning to re retaliate against our industrial practices, a biosphere that is generating effects that impinge on our everyday lives, climate change, sea level rise, permafrost melting, and the upturning of stable weather patterns. In short, we have to think of a capital moves, moves around these days, which are the days of the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene being the name that ge geologists and other scientists are giving to, to the age we've been shoved in, an age that was brought about by human intervention, by the rampant use of fossil fuels. Although he's currently based in Chicago, Holmes lived in Paris between 1990 and 2009, and during that time collaborated with a number of political art and activist groups, including Nepa Plier, Public Netbase, Hacktictura, Macrolab, and published in journals such as Multitudes, Spingerin, and Brumaria. With Claire Pentecost and the 16 Beaver Group, he organized the Continental Drift Seminars in the mid-2000s. His writings revolve around art, free cooperation, the network society, political economy, and grassroots resistance. His books include Escape the Overcode, Activist Art in the Control Society, and Unleashing the Collective Phantoms, Essays in Reverse Imagineering. As I have already mentioned, we're very happy that um, Brian is in our faculty for the spring semester. Uh, he's undertaking a course with our students 
in which they're investigating the port of Miami and how logistics currently function in Miami. Um, so without further ado, Brian Holmes is here. Okay, well obviously I want to uh, thank Cannonball and Pam for inviting me here and uh, maybe less obviously thank Jean for uh, giving one of the more serious introductions I've ever experienced. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a cultural critic. Uh, I'm really, uh, I would say that means I'm a social theorist who has let himself be affected by art. And that means that uh, when I go into a subject, I try to work with all of these things. Aesthetic impulses, existential territories, organizational forms and abstract concepts. And that's what I'm going to do today. Of course, I'm going to do that in a concrete way with a real place, which is Chicago, where I live. And uh, that means that each of these categories or each of these sort of uh, fields of experience and of experimentation take on uh, contents, you know, actual contents that gives rise to a kind of diagram. And just in advance, I'll show you that diagram. <clears throat> what this means will gradually become clear. Uh, the name of this talk, this talk's actually, uh, I'm writing a book which is, is called uh, The River and the Steersman. What I'm gonna do today is uh, read some short excerpts from the first chapter, which is entitled Southwest Corridor, Northwest Passage. So, our investigation began with a massively invisible object, sighted on grassy fields where the prairie used to be. No one seemed to know much about this place, although it's the most up-to-date version of Chicago's identity as Railroad City. Center Point Intermodal Center is an inland port, Union Pacific and BNSF. Here, 40-foot containers packed tight with Chinese commodities arrive by train from Los Angeles and Long Beach. They're unloaded with powerful gantry cranes, then transferred by short-haul truck to nearby distribution centers. In these vast linear buildings served by innumerable loading bays, the containers are unpacked and the goods are sorted by thousands of nimble and suffering hands. Then they are reloaded and dispatched by 16 wheelers to points of sale and consumption all over the Midwest. The BNSF yard alone lifts almost a million containers a year. What lies forgotten in the outskirts of Chicago is a major hub in the contemporary circulation of capital. I and my collaborator, Rosalinda Borsila, who will be coming here next week, wanted to try an experiment in perception. We wondered if it were possible to see not just the intermodal center itself, but the form of society to which it gives rise. We wondered if the organization of this place held a key to the enigma of distant human labor in China, Mexico, and other places around the world. We also wondered if we could get closer to the invisible, often undocumented human labor right here in the sprawling warehouse district that surrounds the intermodal yards. Finally, we wondered how the speed and precision of corporate supply change was affecting our own lives. What we could see, in fact, were mainly blank walls, chain link fences, and keep out signs. Like most corporate facilities, in the age of high security and increasing grassroots scrutiny, all the center point rail yards and distribution facilities are strictly closed to the public. Yet they are wide open to other visitors, as we discovered in October 2012, when we both went out separately to the site in solidarity with striking warehouse workers. Some 600 people gathered in a vast deserted landscape then marched together down a public road toward the receiving gates of the Walmart Distribution Center. Upon our arrival at the gates, 
an entire armored police team, complete with a sonic weapon mounted on a black Humvee, emerged from inside the Walmart facility. This was a rapid deployment force, outfitted with the surplus military hardware whose use on civilians became familiar to Americans in the wake of the Ferguson uprising. At the time, we did not know that the Home Depot Corporation would soon be opening a rapid deployment center just two miles away. But with our own eyes, we could see the link between the corporate logic of distribution and the military science of logistics. Rosalinda and I had come at this place from two different directions, and we were surprised, surprised to see each other out there on that October day. Until then, my interest had been mainly theoretical. In a 2011 article, I explored the cybernetic roots of just-in-time production, which integrates feedback from sales into planning on the factory floor. This technique of Japanese origin led to the concept of integrated global supply chain, which dominates managerial practice today. Rosalinda's approach, on the other hand, had been mainly territorial. She had helped facilitate an immigrant's bicycle caravan across the warehouse district where the center point facility is located. And while moving through this basin of immigrant labor, she had begun to ask about the parallels between distribution centers and deportation centers, both of which were warehousing human beings. Certain nondescript buildings surrounded by barbed wire fences and designated as foreign trade zones had particularly caught her eye. Together, we wanted to discover much more about what was happening in this estranged landscape on the out outskirts of Chicago. Theory and territorial experience were coming up short at the black box of corporate organization. We were certain that with a little effort, we could find out a lot more about how this thing worked. But we also wanted to share our understanding more broadly or at least in a different way than we had been doing before. And that led to the question of art. Could we transform our slow and detailed investigations into some kind of affective pulse that anyone could intuitively feel? We had no idea whether this would really be possible. The apprehension of massively invisible objects, or of what Timothy Morton calls hyperobjects, is disturbing. It can keep you awake at night. It can get under your skin. The uncertainty about exactly what is being discussed, along with the risk that this could become a project about everything, made it difficult to proceed. How to grasp networks of such great extension whose direct impacts on your life are largely produced at a distance? How to bring into focus not just individual machines or landscape features, but an entire pattern of organization with roots seeking deep into history. How to convey a form of understanding that does not yet, that does not happen through the senses, or not only through the senses, but cannot be confined to abstract representation either. Gradually, we worked out some ways to answer these questions, including something like a theory of our own approach. This theory in identified three main vectors of activity for which we use the keywords devices, corridors, and narratives. So this was like the first thing that we kind of sketched out as we were uh, uh, beginning to do this work. This idea, the device is info-mechanical, the corridor is geo-historical, the narrative is psychosocial. I'm gonna let these keywords organized the way that I tell the story here. In the first place, we found ourselves continually analyzing the operational functions of the transportation industry, where the movement of goods is articulated by devices ranging in complexity from a simple 10-pound twist lock that holds a stack of containers together to a gigantic post-Panamax ship built in Korea by the Maersk Corporation. The articulation of the devices extends outward from local to national to continental and finally to global scale. Yet everywhere, it remains substantively the same, strangely abstract, 
replicated in similar patterns around the world. The shipping container itself, the box, is obviously the primary device invented in 1956 and massively adopted in the course of the 1970s following its deployment by US military logistics during the Vietnam War. By focusing on a very concrete, on a number of very concrete mechanical and electronic devices, we hope to grasp the organizational diagram of which the center point installation is just a small part. So we were fascinated by all the things that you see in rail yards and in, at intermodal centers, you know, all these ways of tracking the boxes and also identifying the people who work in there with elaborate electronic systems. Also all these pieces of heavy equipment that move these thing around and facilitate the sort of really smooth, really flexible flow of goods across the global space. And we spent a long time getting inside those places, getting to know those technologies, and meeting people who work there. We were also interested, though, in other sorts of devices which are legal and uh, also even uh, have to do with international treaties, like the foreign trade zones themselves, which uh, contain all that sort of electronic, you know, logistics software, but which deploy it in an environment that is really a legal environment, uh, an entirely, uh, an entire, uh, entirely symbolic environment or environment of conventions. And to really understand the social form that you're dealing with, you have to look into that meeting between the technologies and the sort of computational routines on the one hand and the whole political economy that structures world trade on the other. And when you look into it, you realize that that's happening everywhere, just like it's happening here in Miami. So that's kind of what we're doing in the course, is looking into how these things uh, take place on the ground here in Miami. The devices, however, do not only exist in the homogeneity of a space that they produce through their own operations. They also exist in the heterogeneity of historical time which sediments their concentration on a given territory at a given scale. This historical layering forms what we call a corridor. So a second vector of activity led us to explore the history of particular corridors at particular scales. We started with the one in Chicago that leads southwest from the downtown loop to the center point site some 40 miles away following the pathway of the canal that first connected Lake Michigan to the Illinois River system. Later, we went on to explore sites in Kansas City, in Lázaro Cárdenas, Mexico, and in the Panama Canal Zone. While walking the corridors and encountering the cultural signs and material traces of their history, we began to be affected by the reality of path dependency, which is the tendency for successive generations of technology to reiterate themselves in the same place, even as the technology itself continues to morph and change over time. So you have this idea of path dependency. It also means uh, stuff goes where stuff is. Machines build up in kind of sedimentary layers in the same places, and so you often get a canal, a railroad track, a highway, an airport, and then today, the new logistics installations. And that's exactly uh, what we found in Chicago. Um, an historical corridor, corridor brings together radically different phases of development in a linear flow over the same territory. It is a landscape of ruins pierced by a futurity that can never quite separate itself from its many pasts. This becomes a civilizational ground that you can actually feel beneath your feet, in certain places anyway. Now, one of those places is the place that's pictured in the photograph on the screen right now. That's a place where a local narrator, an amateur historian, will tell you the story of how Chicago was discovered. Chicago was 
I put discovered in quotes because Chicago was found by two European explorers from French Canada who were led there by Potawatomi Indians. And the reason they were led there is that Chicago, it turns out, actually sits on the continental divide between the Great Lakes Basin and the Mississippi River Basin. What you have to do when you get there is drag your canoe through a whole lot of mud, and after a couple of hours, or in the worst case, maybe a day, you can reach the Great Lakes from the Illinois River System, from the Mississippi River System. And so that's what our explorers did. They were coming back. They were headed back to Canada, and on their way back, they discovered Chicago. Um, later on, what happened was that, that two centuries later, that area was uh, judged to be of military significance because as the two explorers had realized, a canal could be dug there. So the United States, the young United States government, following the War of 1812, marked off the area, set up a kind of zone of exclusion, and proposed to build a canal. Now we had a lot of laughs about the images that these uh, that, that we get of these two explorers, uh, Marquette and Joliet discovered Chicago. You have these sort of cookie cutter images all over the place, including in this ridiculous sculpture right out in front of the, the heritage site, you know. But the really interesting thing was, it turns out that these explorers, like all the others, weren't coming, they weren't searching for America at all. They were searching for the Northwest Passage to China. That's what everybody wanted in the days when North America was being discovered by the Europeans. They didn't even want to stop. They wanted to find the river that would carry them over the barrier all the way to the Orient where the riches are, you know? And so what they found instead, just like here in Florida, was they found a swamp. This was the territory, you know, the real territory, and they said, we could construct a, but uh, one league of canal and we would be able to fly over this swamp, you know? So basically, in Chicago, private property and public debt originate with the building of the canal. That's how the whole place was capitalized, on the basis of the massive debt that had to be occurred. And that debt itself was uh, guaranteed by the creation of private property. So this infrastructure, this canal, this desire to reach the Orient is all bound up with the very foundations of the world that we live in, and not just with the latest developments of intermodal transportation. The railways, the grain elevators, and the financiers all followed the same path. And ultimately, they got to Asia. They discovered the Northwest Passage. We found out as we researched this, you know, this desire to get to Asia, this desire to send a faster train, this desire to reach a more modern port, this desire to connect with the, the new manufacturing centers of the world uh, was affecting uh, people all over the United States, just like it's happening here with the $2 billion transformation of the port in Miami. And one of the things that interests us a lot was this railway, the um, Kansas City Southern Railway. It also goes to Asia by way of a southwest corridor that reaches continental scale. So instead of going 40 miles out of Chicago, this one goes several thousand miles all the way to the port of Lázaro Cárdenas in Mexico, in southern Mexico. And it turns out that this was the dream of a Kansas City Southern executive, the guy who started the company, the original owner, back in 1905, who wanted to build the same kind of railroad for the same reason to reach the Pacific Coast, and he was stopped by the Mexican Revolution. Apparently Zapata was actually working for this railroad when he decided that the better thing would do, to do would be uh, to change in his shovel for a gun and uh, get rid of the uh, imperialists altogether. So it's, uh, it's quite a story that uh, uh, it has a lot of further dimensions I'm not gonna get into, because when I actually got to the port, I realized, uh, well, just before leaving, it had been taken over by the Mexican army, and it turned out that the port was, this super modern uh, 21st century port was actually under the control of the local drug gang called the Knights Templar. And th this is when I started to get into the whole theory of narco-capitalism, which I think we could talk a lot about here in Miami. But uh, I'm not gonna get into that today. I'm gonna go right ahead with this uh, 
presentation here. It turns out that the same railroad runs parallel to the Panama Canal. So all the pieces of the puzzle are really coming together here. The Panama Canal, of course, is the ultimate continental uh, global corridor that goes all the way uh, across the world, of course, that opens up the world space to the flow of goods. And, and so I actually did manage to get down to the Panama Canal as well and explore this concept of the Panama Canal zone and the zonians who live there, which is something really incredible. Uh, as you know, this was built by the U.S., fundamentally by the U.S. military uh, from in the period from 1904 to 1914 after the Spanish-American War, which, which uh, gave uh, the U.S. reason to want to be able to move its warships much faster from the West Coast to the East Coast. So if all, all of that kind of put together the structure of our project, which you can see in the website that exists today, which is uh, uh, southwestcorridornorthwestpassage.org. Uh, going from, um, you know, you have two canals, two military zones with local, national, and continental corridors in between. And everyone is still dreaming of Asia. This also kind of completed our understanding of the really, this, this sort of diagram of of, of uh, what you might call a diagram of social complexity because it's a diagram that takes into account at once uh, aesthetics, you know, dreams, existential territories, organizational forms, and theories. And uh, as I said before, that could look like that with the Northwest Passage being the fundamental dream, the swamp or mud lake being the basic territory that the explorers had to confront, and the railroads being the technique, the organizational form, that really allowed in the end for the realization of that dream, the land bridge to China, you know? And all that today being coordinated by the most complex logistic, uh, logistics technologies that I'm not gonna get into. Because what we really wanted to do, we did want to get into, that, into all that, and, and we do, and we have been doing so for a long time. But what we were really interested in uh, was this idea of generating narratives. Walking as the least mediated film of mobility allowed us to develop an empathic relation to these landscapes, these pathways. For us, walking and narrative are one and the same. This is a kind of passion shared by all those who do field work in the weirdly banal urban or exurban spaces where the Anthropocene layer of geology is actually manufactured. Through the experience of walking, we were moved to speak and to express ourselves in various ways. Rosalinda already had a long-standing practice of organizing itineraries and perceptual encounters, so we developed that practice further. The elaboration of a narrative dimension in motion, including visual artifacts and performative gestures along with verbal signs, became a third vector of activity defining our project. Mapping, photography, video making, oral and written storytelling, and the organization of group excursions were a way to present not just the articulation of the devices, but above all, a kind of multi-layered enunciation that could unfold within, but also askew from the corridor. And so we started to travel together over the continental divide that runs right through our city and across the social divides that are omnipresent in the city of Chicago. And we, we had a really interesting time with these walks, um, telling people, you know, kind of opening people up by, by picking out strange pathways through the urban space and often pathways through areas that are more, you know, deserted, these kind of landscape of ruins sort of things. Uh, meeting people who actually live in these landscapes, uh, uh, people who are able to feel what we could then talk about and teach people to see, which is a, uh, a very much a divided landscape, uh, a landscape of deep social divides that also happens to be the continental divide, which is something that basically nobody knows, you know? And we, we became super interested in those ruined areas uh, of uh, 
what's called you know, the post-industrial landscape, but it's not. What it is is uh, new, often exacerbated forms of industry, like the Koch brothers operations in Chicago, which are really actually quite damaging for the city. And uh, also uh, meeting people like this guy, who is a, a tremendous activist, uh, former steel worker, running a small NGO called the Southeast Environmental Task Force, and uh, getting to know these landscapes, which are part of our lives, but which remain invisible and unconscious until you invent a form for interacting with them. And what we were trying to do was invent that form and bring, you know, including Rosalinda's little daughter, bring everyone we could into this form and, you know, not shying away from activism or involvement either because we don't just do art, we do life, you know. We do theory, we do activism, uh, we do inhabitation, and uh, we also do art. And so this is the kind of thing that, that uh, well, that people have been building up in, in Chicago and certainly in many places, but I happen to know that place, you know, because I've been living there these last years. Our work uh, in this cycle of walks kind of came to a culmination with this big hole in the ground, a sand pit where frac sand is actually mined. These guys uh, were really not happy to hear uh, from environmentalists, to tell you the truth. Um, uh, we were quite interested to hear from them, though, and uh, we continued to check these things out. We also met this uh, pretty amazing anti-sand mining activist while we were there. And our process basically came to a conclusion right here at the, where the old canal pours into the river. And this was kind of the last moment of the, uh, the month-long cycle of walks that we had set up, but certainly not the last moment of this project because it's, it's ongoing and basically what uh, I'm doing here in, in, in Miami, and, and Rosalinda is going to come uh, uh, to kind of take over next week. So we're kind of opening up uh, another chapter here in Florida of a, of a long, uh, ongoing project. So just to conclude, uh, I could say that although one hesitates to put it into words, what's at stake in this kind of cultural practice is clearly an attempt to struggle with a particular form of life, underwritten and sustained by a vast system of machines. Today, climate change reveals that form of life to be a dead end. The notion of pathodependency, an idea freely adopted from the Chicago artists group Feel Tank, became, in my head anyway, a code word for the struggle to get to know and at the same time exorcise the massively invisible object. The question of how to change pathways is the one that we were really asking at all the stops along the Southwest Corridor. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody has any questions? I'm a little confused with the term continental divide. Normally that would be between the Pacific and the Atlantic on the Rocky Mountains. Now, there is a divide, as you have pointed out, between Chicago and, uh, or I should say, between the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico. Is that a continental divide or is that an Atlantic Ocean uh, situation? For example, that divide continues to Newport News and separates the Labrador Current from the Gulf Stream. So that's. Yeah, sure. It's, it, they can, it can be called in different ways. It's also uh, sometimes called a subcontinental divide, but so would be the Rockies then too, because what's really happening is that uh, on the, on actually Chicago, most of the city uh, uh, should be draining into the Great Lakes, which then drains into the Atlantic. Um, what's happened is that the Chicago River has been reversed. So the entire flow of, of the area around Chicago now drains across the Continental Divide into the Mississippi, which, which, which ultimately goes into the Gulf of Mexico. So that's uh, two, you know, that, that's kind of the major 
divide on the east side of the North American continent, and on the west side you have the Rockies. Everything on one side goes into the Mississippi, and everything on the other goes into the, uh, um, into the Pacific Ocean. Um, now, I, I, I think, I just call it the continental divide because I'm not sure which terminology to really use, you know? What does it really mean? There are really more than that because there's also in the north another dividing line that divides the water that flows into the Mississippi from that which goes out to the Arctic, you know? So you actually have another continental divide up north. And, uh, and this is, you know, this is the, the great thing of the watersheds, which, which I know that's an interest that we share and, and I'm, I'm really, uh, happy to share it because not that many people seem to share this interest, but you know, it's growing, you know, as the water creeps up through this stone here, people are getting more and more interested in uh, water in Florida as well, so. Thank you for your talk, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, at the end, uh, you made a reference to the possibilities of changing paths. I mean, a lot of your presentation had to do with path dependency and we saw the vast scale of path dependency when we looked at the um, shipping routes, the airline routes, and so on and so forth, as well as many others, uh, the, the canals and what have you. So one thing is making, I mean, I'm thinking of strategies for changing yeah, path. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And yeah. so one thing is obviously making it visible, as you were saying at the beginning. What other things do you have in mind for dealing with these, what seem to be intractable path yeah. dependencies? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think the first thing, certainly the first thing is to make it visible, but the second thing is to make it walkable. That is to say, to bring it into your body, you know? To bring the vision that you have, which is double, you know? A vision of, uh, uh, you know, sort of, it's fundamental to humanity, you know, terror and delight, you know, this is what moves us, you know. So if you can find a way to let yourself be moved by it, I think this is the artistic, you know, moment of, of the work, you know. But the next thing is, is that, that that terror and that delight are incarnated not just in your own body walking a pathway, but also in, in, in the, the, the things that civilization lays down in that pathway. And I think that, that when we work in the arts, I think it's, it's really a mistake to divide as we have done and to professionalize the divide between the arts and not just the sciences, but technics itself, you know? So the thing that I'm interested in is exploring the technics, which, is, which again is a double exploration. On the one hand, it's about really understanding how things do work because that's the only way you can set up Polit any kind of political, uh, um, first of all, real opposition, and then second of all, of course, exploring how things work differently. And I, I think that, you know, um, I think that means, as they say in, in uh, uh, South America so often, poner el cuerpo, you know? You have to put your body on the line, you know? Putting your body on the line means putting, not just putting it symbolically on the line, it means really putting yourself into this thing, you know? So what, what people around me have been doing for years is uh, the whole world of the alternative agriculture, you know? And, and finally, even a theorist like myself has become caught up in these things, you know? So now I think the thing to do is to start with the alternative technologies. I mean, I use free software and stuff, you know? So I've been doing it as a theorist would with codes, you know? But now I want to do it with dirt, you know? Um, as everybody around me is doing. And try to make this kind of theoretical praxis, which then I think we need to spread through the universities, you know? Because the universities have become the incubators of uh, just of the transnational capitalist class, you know? That's really what's happened to the universities. It's a whole system for creating uh, blind professional, uh, you know, um, transformers of the earth, you know? But people who transform it blindly. How can we create in, the, in universities and elsewhere a possibility to embody not just to dream but an actual transformative process. It seems to me that, uh, I mean, when I showed those paths, I, mean, I wasn't kidding when I said, it's disturbing. <laughs> it is disturbing, it's huge, you know? But coming to Florida is a kind of amazing experience because here in Miami, 
probably not in the rest of Florida. Here in Miami, so many people I meet are conscious of uh, this. When I, when I talk about a massively invisible object, you know, I thought I would have to explain it. The students are explaining it to me. Because they say, we're living this thing. And, and we know what you're talking about. So that's, that's I mean, I don't think there's, um, uh, there are technical solutions, of course. Uh, but to make the technological solutions happen, you need, a, you need to create a political change. And to make a political change happen, you need a cultural change. And to make a cultural change happen, you need a personal change. So those things all work together, or they don't. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's the answer I can give. Sorry, it's a bit uh, roundabout. <laughs> Thank you for the lecture. I would like to uh, um, better understand where exactly you place the uh, concept of art in your research. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I place the activity of expressivity at the beginning uh, of things. It seems to me that art, it, it isn't a concept, but it's rather an affect, you know? It's a created affect, like all affects. Affects are human creations. But what's important about art is not the fact that it's there on the wall. I think what's important about it is that it's here in your body, you know? It's when it moves from what I call aesthetic impulses to existential territories that it becomes, uh, uh, that it starts to realize a potential. And, and there are many potentials to any sort of artistic expression, or to any aesthetic, really. So I, 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 I'm also not just interested in paintings or just interested in sculptures, although I'm quite interested in paintings and sculptures. I mean, one thing I realized a long time ago is I would talk with the hardcore activists that, uh, that I so admired, because I too am a hardcore activist, and uh, I found with the great majority of them that after talking for a while, they would explain their discovery of some kind of art, you know? Dadaism, situationism, who knows what? It could even be, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe it, it could be you know, Brazilian concrete art or something, or Elio Tishika, I don't know what. But they would always tell me that. And I thought, this is the same experience I have. So there's something going on here. So yeah, now we practice, we tend to practice on the, you know, not far left forms of art that don't, aren't really recognizable as art anymore because they're, they're, they're more about gesture and performance than they are about you know, making objects and stuff. I remain interested in objects as long as people are bringing them into themselves. I think that's where it becomes really, that's where the, you, you move from just having a concept of art to having an experience of art. So that's, that's what interests me. That's where I place it. I place it in a way, in that way, at the spot that opens up. But if you just are always opened up and opened up, that can go on forever. You want to do something. <laughs> I, I thought the, the thought the talk was fascinating too. I, I have a, a question. I wonder whether it's an issue of different terminology. Maybe we're talking about the same things using different words. Coming from a critical geography perspective, um, particularly influenced by uh, French thinkers like Henri Lefebvre, um, I tend to look at very similar issues that you yeah, describe, sure, course, but yeah. perhaps from a perspective not just of path dependency and corridors, but the historical geographers, ge uh, historical geographies of unevenly developed territories. And the corridor is structuring those differences between cores and peripheries. Actually, I'm doing research on infrastructure, cross-border infrastructure uh, planning in South America. And what the official planning talks about hubs now are infrastructure corridors. So the hub is no longer a point, a fortress area, but a corridor, a line, an infrastructure that connects privileged places and structure the territory, leaving those places outside the line as peripheries. So um, my question is, how much, you know, do you look at yeah, yeah. things that way? Not oh, just yeah, as yeah, historical yeah. decantation, but also the product of s spatial dependencies, not just path dependencies. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Well, it's um, uh, 
all paths are not the same. I mean, when the United States military marks out a path, what's likely to get built there has particular characteristics. So uh, this is what really struck us in our exploration of Chicago. Now going further, I mean, what I just kind of hinted at the kind of things you're talking about by comparing the, um, the colonial uh, takeover of Chicago, you know, which was accompanied, I mean, before you could, I, I actually forgot to mention one thing. I go, make sure I write that in there. Um, fundamental, which is that to create the private property is one thing. To make it valuable in, entailed kicking out the Indians. The land rush began in Chicago in 1834. That was after uh, what in the United States at the time was called Indian removal took place. Indians were pushed farther back beyond another line, beyond another of so many lines that they kept getting pushed back to. Uh, this process in many ways reiterated itself with the, the Panama Canal Zone, another zone that when you look at it, it looks almost you know, parallel to the one, it's a, but that's because it's the same family of you know, zone, military zone making that you find in Chicago. And so if I just recall what that looks like right here, um, you can see the kind of mirror image between the two exclusion zones, the one in white and the one in green. Um, going further in this series of lectures on Thursday, I'm gonna talk about the group A La Plastica in Argentina, whose conceives as their work, it's rare that an art group conceives of their work as having an antagonist but they do, it's called IRSA. It's called the uh, Initiative for the Infrastructure, the Regional Infrastructure Development of South America. <laughs> and that's exactly what you're talking about. So there in that lecture, I'll go much deeper into what infrastructure is today. And it's that infrastructure is basically the same sort of plan in the United States itself as it is in South America. Um, you know, increasingly in the United States, also I would, I would uh, mentioned that we are subject to extractivism with the same kind of violence that the rest of the world is now. In fact, I'm part of a campaign to stop these trains full of explosive oil that run right through the population, major population centers of the East Coast. They could explode at any time, killing hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, this is the, this is the kind of thing that these infrastructural processes do. And of course, they are colonial in origin and they they have to do with military domination. And I think that very much, I mean, I think the reduction of the United States to people who for a, a whole period of time absolutely ceased to think about the consequences of their actions has to do with, because this really happened, you know, from the 80s onward. I mean, that's why we're in the mess we're in now. And that has a lot to do with the fact that instead of responding to the contestation of the 1970s, capital in the United States decided to export industrial processes first to Mexico and then above all to Asia. And that allowed us to live in a bubble of mere ideas, mere art if you will, mere aesthetics for a good 30 years until the situation became so critical that uh, 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 two things began. People began to be aware of it, and then the backlash from the political right towards that awareness started, and that's what we're living in now. So I think that this, this military origin and this connection uh, between uh, corridors and domination is fundamental and structuring to society. When I talk about the civilizational ground that we walk on, that's exactly what I'm talking about, and that's Worse than path dependency, that's why I was mentioning this idea of kind of patho dependency, you know? It's a pathology that one becomes dependent on. And I think this is the, the really, really powerful thing. So I don't know, I, you know, I'm an amateur geographer, like I'm an amateur at a lot of things, but I'm very, very interested in the type of geography that you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs>